That's so, so smart. <laughs> All right, bear with me just a second and I will get this online. Let's see here. We are coming along and I want to welcome everybody to this week's live and bear with me just a second, guys, just setting this up so that we are all good. Guys, um, let's see, I am I am accompanied by Scott Carney's best-selling author. You might have known him from um, the What Doesn't Kill Us or The Wedge. Those are his uh, some of his recent offerings. And uh, today we're talking about his next project. Before we get to that, though, real quick, I have not taken my Magic Mind, a all-natural nootropic blend that I want to thank for sponsoring the channel. So let me just... When you take this, are you going to transform? Oh, dude, you, you don't even rip know. Rip off your shirt. And like, <laughs> shirt? <laughs> I, I won't even need a shirt. It's just, I, the beard changes colors. I mean, I can see through walls. Here, hang on just a minute. Ah, delicious. Here it is. Thanks so much for sponsoring the channel, Magic Mind. If you'd like to get your magic mind, you can check out the links in the description box below and use the coupon code there for um, 20% off. So not too shabby. All right, Scott. So, okay. So I, I was, I, I've been observing, um, I follow you on Instagram. And uh, for those of you guys who, who do not follow Scott on Instagram, lately he's been up to some interesting antics, uh, dressing up like, who was it? Salvador Dali? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, with a French accent, because I can't do a Spanish accent. <laughs> so, so you know, it, at first you'll cringe, but then you'll just, you won't be able to stop watching. And, uh, <laughs> but Scott has a project he's working on right now. And so anytime you're working on a book, I'm always interested in it. Um, it's on a topic that is right in perfect alignment with what we do in this channel, um, especially when it comes to ultimately getting the most out of this life. Um, and uh, especially dealing with the issues of, of the conscious self, uh, our issues of, of our, the unconscious mind, um, how these things work. Um, so this is a book about, what is it? It's a, it's a book about napping, right? It's a book about napping. Hell yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. It is a book about <laughs> napping, guys. Yeah. No. Um, uh, you know, Perfect. Like the stuff that I've done over the years, right? I wrote What Doesn't Kill Us, which is like a, like, that's what I'm most known for. And that's like ice water, breath work, stuff right. that people on this channel get. Mm -hmm. uh, and and a lot of like the Wim Hof method stuff out there is right. sort of like amping yourself up, like finding a way to work in that amped up state. And I know there's more to it, but just go with me here. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm with you. <laughs> and, and, and then also like my follow-up book, The Wedge, which was like, after you've been doing the Wim Hof method for 10 years, what's next? And so I found all these like sort of in stimuluses, stimuli that, um, that you immerse yourself in that have like a, a bodily response, which is just natural. Like your body just like, you know, you look at, um, you're looking over a cliff and, that, and, you know, you feel that the butt tightening feeling, um, mm. how you can use those feelings to change the way your physiology works. Just like when you jump into ice water and control yourself, or when you're holding your breath and you have that gas reflex and you're able to, to um, lengthen it. These are all the concepts that I call the wedge because um, yeah. you're putting your mind as a wedge between the stimulus and your physiological responses. So that's where I've been for a long time doing lots of like, I climbed up Kilimanjaro in a bathing suit. Like I did all sorts of like crazy stunts, but now I'm super interested in the other side of the equation. What happens in our rest state? How can we get the best possible sleep? Because, you know, it's always sides of a coin. And uh, so, uh, and, you know, I've always done these like big books with like big publishers giving me tons of money and stuff. And I'm like, this time I am going right to the people unite <laughs> we will nap together uh, and uh and it's been awesome like it's it's you know i have this kickstarter campaign i'm sure there'll be links all over the place and uh you yes. know my cover is like a, a cheetah who's falling asleep on a on a branch because you know the thing about resting is is you need the processing that goes on in your mind and in your body, you need that rest state in order to have active states. So how do we have better naps? How do we get better sleep at night? Um, there's a ton of really, really awesome books on sleep, but there's been a lot fewer, particularly on naps. So I'm using concepts from the wedge uh, and I'm developing a new protocol, which I think is gonna Ooh. be bananas. 
uh, but it doesn't nice. have anything to do with bananas. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is going to be really, really interesting, um, sort of like combining the best parts of the placebo effect, the adherence effect, um, you know, consciousness and, and cognitive behavioral therapy, along with um, a very, very common and cheap supplement that you can get anywhere uh, that mm -hmm. will that I think will alter the way we think about about napping and how to get into it really quickly. And I can go into that if you have questions, but yeah, yeah, actually, this reminds me um, as as we were kind of sharing on social media, hey, we're going to be having this talk about napping. Uh, one of the, our viewers, Howard, uh, he's not watching. I, I shouldn't say hello. He literally is napping right now. Oh, good. Um, okay, and and I and I thought it was a joke at first. I thought, okay, that was that was good. I'll, he's, a, I'm sorry, I'll be taking a nap. Apparently, this is what he does on days he has off. He takes a nap at this time. So you're watching Howard on the replay. We appreciate that. Um, but when it comes to when it comes to taking a nap, I, I've got to admit, I am not good at napping. Mm -hmm. um, my wife naps she can fall asleep no problem mm -hmm. i've always had a hard time falling asleep have okay. you found that there's some kind of um uh, something something that because i've always i've been so envious i'm mm -hmm. like how you know there you are you're asleep and it takes me you know forever to, to, to fall okay. asleep and, yes yeah. have mm -hmm. you found anything to maybe that's, expedite that's that? actually specifically what I'm working on. But there's two things okay. I want to say. One, yeah. if you lie down and close your eyes and just sort of like let yourself drift off, you're mm -hmm. still getting benefits of that sleep state. You know, one of the mm -hmm. things I was talking with Adam Har Horowitz over at MIT, who's a dream scientist, and he's amazing. Like I've fallen in love with this, like a man crush on this dude. Awesome. Um, he is, uh, what he said to me is like, you're dreaming all the time. Like, what do you, what do you think your awake state is? What is going on in your brain? I was like, whoa, man. Like, and Tell me like, more, Scott. It wasn't some psychedelic thing. It's like, you know, when you are like fully alert, right? We make connections that are proximate, okay? And so mm -hmm. the, by, by this, what I mean is like, when you're focused on something, if I show you a cup, mm -hmm. you might think tea, right? That's gonna be right. your word association. Cup, tea, cup, cupboard, cup, right. ceramics, something like that. You're gonna be like, you're gonna be like, direct between these two things but as you drift off into sleep states mm -hmm. your uh, the the natural associations are no longer direct right so you might see cup and your brain might go walrus uh interesting and, okay and this is a really really important thing because when we're hyper focused and we're and we're, we're we want to get something done it's super useful to have like railroad vision um mm -hmm. but when you go abstract and you rest and in your dream states, you know, dreams are wild. Like the other day I was eating tacos on a gondola and I woke up yelling into the word, into not yelling, but like saying with the words, enjoy the tacos. And like, you know, <laughs> like this is a sort of like random, it seems random, but it's not a screensaver. What's actually happening is it's allowing, your brain is making predictions about the future. And it's trying to make at these abstract connections in order to like form memories and form consciousness, form feelings. Um, and you know, I asked, so this is a little bit of a digression, but I just thought it was so cool. Adam told me, uh, I asked him, look, if dreams are so important, why can't you remember them? Okay. Ah, uh, okay. And, and, and he's like, yeah, you know, that's, that's really, really fascinating. Are memories important? Uh, he asked because memories and, and what is a memory? Like, if you think back mm -hmm. to like your childhood, right? right. You might have an image of your, your mother making macaroni and cheese for you or your bedroom or something, but these are not actually crystal clear. They're actually gists. They're mm -hmm. actually like your brain. If you collected every piece of information, it would be too cluttered. So what actually happens is in the dream state, it takes out the most salient information, bonds all that information into a feeling and your memory is actually a feeling. And the reason you do that is not because you're looking backwards in life, but memories are useful for actions you will take in the future. And feelings navigate you through the wor world. Right. For instance, you look at an ice bath, maybe someone here has taken an ice bath, the instinctual feeling, even today for me, I've been here for 10 years doing this stuff. I'm still like, oh, fuck no. <laughs> Why do I have to be the ice bath guy? Like still, still. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and, um, and, and, and that feeling is something you push against. That's what consciousness is for, right? Is to say, right. here's the feeling. Here's, now I have the feeling. Now I can decide with my rational focused mind. But it's this interplay between the two things. And you need sleep 
to form those feelings, to form those gists. And if you don't get it, and there's lots of different types of sleep problems that are out there, you start breaking down uh, mentally, your memory goes, you know, this can lead to Alzheimer's dementia late in life, um, immune system cracks up, you know, like, like you get cancer. I mean, you freaking fall apart when you're not yeah. sleeping well. Okay, so there's all of that. Now let me do the second half. You are not a great sleeper, yeah. right? <laughs> I'm a terrible napper. I, I can, I can, once I get to the point, then I just, it's kind of like, I really want to just stay there yeah, for eight hours. Sure. And, <laughs> but and a nap be, thing, I don't know. Yeah. It could be that you don't need it. A, okay. right? if you get great sleep all the time, you feel alert and fine all the time. I mean, you don't need a nap. Nap's not essential, but a nap is a really great boost, especially around two or three in the afternoon mm -hmm. when you have this, uh, something happens in your melatonin, like you have a melatonin drop and that's like a perfect time to take like a 15 to 20 minute nap. Um, and, but, but here's one thing. So even if you just lie down, you yeah. You get some of that, what they call hypnagogia, hypnagogia. I can't, it's, I don't know if it's Greek or, or uh, Latin, uh, hypnagogia, right? Where, okay. where sounds where, Greek. Yeah. Where you, um, you have, you, you start making these more disparate connections. You're half dreaming yeah. and you know, with Salvador Dali, this is why I was dressed up as Salvador yeah, Dali, yeah, yeah. right? He would fall asleep with like a, a spoon or like an iron ball in his hand, like a big ball bearing. And as he would fall asleep, your hands relax, like your muscle tone right. goes out at some point, the ball would fall to the ground, it would wake him up. And then he'd wake up with these abstract ideas in his head. And that hypnagogic moment lasts for about 20 minutes to a half an hour where you can be suddenly creative, where you are making naturally more abstract connections. So it actually could be a great hack for creative pursuits, more like fresh perspectives on things. Uh, and, and you can actually use the short nap as a tool um, where you also get a little bit of rest. And, you know, you, 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 if you nap at three in the afternoon, I'm basically done mentally by about one or two in the afternoon anyway. Uh, that's just me, right? And a nap actually gives me another hour or two of like useful consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, but here, let me tell you my protocol. Cause, yeah, cause let's hear it. Fucking around here, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I've been hanging out with um, Adam Rodman, who's a, 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 a doctor over in at Harvard. Um, yeah. He he has a, a a great podcast called Bedside Rounds. Highly suggested. Very cool. nerdy, wonky, internist, doctory stuff. Um, but that he was telling good. me, you know, in clinical trials, and we're working on a different project. We'll, we can talk about that next time. Yeah. But he was telling me that in clinical trials, the placebo that most studies use is niacin or caffeine. And caffeine, we know what caffeine does. But niacin, mm -hmm. I was like, well, why niacin? Is it because it has this something called a niacin flush? Yeah. Where you get vasodilation in your face and your chest, you turn a little red, and there's some sensations associated with it, but it doesn't really do much more than that. It's just a flush. But it's but because there's a sensation there, um, you can it makes people think they might be taking an active medication, and so they sure. don't know wh what control arm they're in. It's the activeness, which is the interesting thing about niacin. And so I'm developing a sleep protocol to use the flush to use niacin as like the unsupplement, right? It's not it's not it's not a supplement okay. because it causes you to sleep. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some sleep benefits, but let's even just put those totally aside. You're using niacin because you want the flush and you want to create an association with sleep. So when you're tired at night, I have you take niacin and in 18 minutes, you, you will get the flush. That's just your biology, right? Take the pill, okay. get the flush, have the sensation. Most people can fall asleep in about 18, like 15 minutes at night. That's pretty normal. Once you decide mm. to close your eyes. Yeah. That's about normal. So we can pair and time the flush with your sleep state. So you're in that okay. hypnagogic moment when you have this flush and then you fall asleep, boom. So we're creating this association. We're creating what I call in the wedge, an internal wedge, right? We're creating the, the wedge where the wedge is in your, where the, the thing that you're associating with is in your body, but we're actually linking it to the sleep state. Do that for a week. Now we have, your, your brain is just, you know, in that, hypnagogic state, you're, you're, you're firing all these synapses together. You're creating new connections. This is one of the connections that just has to happen because 
Maybe you've heard the word interoception. It was like looking inside and feeling your body. We have created an, a, an interoceptive sensation. Now, when you want to take a nap, I, we, we fast forward after you've been doing this for a week, after you trained yourself, I want to go take a nap in like 15 minutes, boom, take that, have the flush lie down. And my assumption here, and I'm testing this, I need more data, I need participants. If your crowd wants to come in and help me with a niacin flush, let's go, give me data. Hey. Um, uh, I, uh, what, what, what should happen here mm -hmm. is that it becomes a sleep trigger. So now you've actually, it's not like you've taken okay. a yeah. pill that puts you out, you've actually trained your brain to do this. And then eventually you can probably even work without the niacin if you wanted to, because you've sort of trained it. And there's some very deep research on this um, with the, the adherence effect, with the placebo effect, um, with, with the sort of this cognitive behavioral training in general. But yeah, it's, it's sort of like revolutionary and really, really fun to be, to be playing in the, in the napping space. That it, well, it's a space that I, you know, I, I know that um, napping is, is, is cultural in, in many parts of the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you go over to Madrid, you know, there's a, there's a, a certain time when most people are taking a nap. You look at a lot of parts of, of the world and that's just a, a regular thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, maybe it's just the whole, um, maybe it's the, you know, coffee driven United States, uh, productivity ad addiction that we have that that's kind of made it uh, sort of like, oh, well, you know, you, you snooze, you lose type of mentality. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is that something, do you think that a 20 minute nap, like the average person, maybe people that are, that are watching or listening right now, um, you know, you, you get up, you go to work eight o'clock or nine o'clock, mm -hmm. you get off of work, maybe four. Um, do you think it's something that maybe on their lunch break, they could take a nap then, or how, how would just on a regular day, how would you recommend so a person I, incorporate that? So some of the, uh, and, and now I've totally forgotten his name, but the most important sleep researcher at Stanford, um, he died in like the 20, 2007, but what he used to do, he'd be in the middle of teaching a class. He'd be like, sorry guys, I got to go nap. And he'd leave the class to nap because he realized <laughs> how important it was. And my feel, you know, um, uh, Teresa, um, uh, uh, Hershey, right, just wrote this book called Rest is Resistance. And, and it's very much like, yo, you have to rest. Grind culture is killing us. And and the the way the, our, our work environments are just toxic in general, and, and they make you stay alert past what is okay. And she links it to, to all the way back to the origins of slavery, where people are first becoming um, uh, treated like cogs in the wheel. And and her her point is rest is resistance. Like you rest and you are actually, it's an active state, not only mentally, um, she's but but more importantly, at least for her, it's we're changing the culture. Mm -hmm. And and my feeling is like, you know, if someone says to me, Oh, you know, my my boss won't ever let me nap because he's, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, fuck your boss. Um, <laughs> because, you know, and, and the best thing that happened in the pandemic, as far as I'm concerned, is the great resignation. People started claiming their own time and mm -hmm. renegotiating what their time means. A nap is actually a way to go to your boss yeah. and say, look, I can work for you and I, we've got a nine to five grind, right? But I'll be honest, like I fall off in the afternoon. And Honestly, mm -hmm. boss, you fall off in the afternoon too, because why <laughs> humans fall off in the afternoon. Right. And if you want me to be a productive member of your team, uh, I am going to take a nap at this time. And if you want, you know, and the way I negotiate, it's usually like take it or fucking leave it. <laughs> um, and some people may have a different attitude here, but that's the way I feel like self-care is so important, especially if you want to be productive. Like if you want me to yeah. be an engaged worker, um, and, and actually create something that's, that's really good versus you just want to steal every moment of my consciousness and turn it into dollars. Like I like that second person less, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm with you on that. Yeah. I guess the, uh, the origin of the, the coffee break was a, uh, industrial revolution, right. Uh, at, it was something that happened during the, the, there was apparently a Thai company that, mm -hmm. uh, would employ, uh, seamstresses and they noticed, Hey, you know, in the afternoons, it's not, we're just not as productive, you know? Right. And, and, and if you look at the way we've treated people since the industrial revolution, you know, um, it's something that, you know, you, you have 
people and machines in a room, but they're all being treated like machines. And, right. and, and I, I can completely resonate with, with that. I mean, there's, there's so much of um, this whole, like your function is to produce for the company and, and, you know, that's all it is. But one thing that I will say that I do think that the last few years, uh, some of the benefits, like you said, with the, the great resignation is that I think people for the longest time, um, and, and you, are, you and I are, in, are we're in the similar generation. Uh, and my wife, uh, she's a millennial. And I, of course, I'm kind of in the middle. But I think a lot of times we were told just to. I'm Gen X, man. I'm not in I, your generation. So, so I'm in the middle. Okay. <laughs> You're a so, slacker. So, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Okay. Boomer. So, so well, see, here's, okay. Here's the, here's the thing. And, and digressions are welcome on this channel. So uh, apparently if you're born between 19, what was it? It's like 1980 and 1983, you're the kind of like in between. And so you, you got to kind of just go based off of the music you listen to. And so I was born in 80. So I'm like, I guess that's Gen X ish. Cause I'm, yeah. I listened to all that music, but the point is I think our generation I'll just jump into yours, our generation. And, and I think a lot of the millennials were like, Hey, we were told you just do what you're told. And, and you don't really have any room to um, negotiate. The boss is the boss. Yep. And, yep. and that's mm -hmm. how it works. And I do think, of course, right now, especially with the shortages that exist, mm -hmm. um, it has put the employee in a wonderful position to say, no, yeah. this has got to be how it's going to be. I'm I'm not quiet quitting. I'm not doing all this other stuff. I'm going to give you a fantastic performance, but there has to be some kind of a compromise. Yeah. Now, would you would you be the type of person who would say, eat lunch, then take a nap immediately after? Or um, how, what would you... What would you say about the combining of meals and uh, and and naps? Because that's that's something that a lot of times people do. In, in general, uh, meals uh, make it more difficult to fall asleep, right? Because your body, mm -hmm. um, according to circadian rhythms and just sort of what it needs to do, when you take a morsel of food, now your body has to like rejigger the stomach lining, you know, drop in some acids, and it's it's working on the food which is also why you shouldn't eat dinner super late right. um, because it, it messes with your circadian rhythm. And then you, you know, you're processing your food when you should be, your body should be replenishing cells and going in and actually getting rid of wastes. Instead, it's storing um, future waste. It's storing fats mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that. So, so I would think that, uh, that, you know, you should probably, if you, if you eat lunch around noon, you should, that's why I think two and three is actually a really good time to take a nap because you're giving your body the, its regiment of things to do. And there's a great book by Sachin um, Panda, Panda called The Circadian Code. If you want to go sort of deep into food and circadian cycles, it's, it's great. The first, all you need to do is read the first 20 pages and he lays out everything. And then everything else is like techniques and like how to like micromanage your, your meals and, and whatnot. <laughs> well okay so that because that that's something that i remember my grandfather just would always after lunch take a nap mm -hmm. and um you know and then i could never figure out how to do that but yeah mm -hmm. a lot of there's a lot of um especially late night snacking it can it can really ruin a person's night's sleep and mm -hmm. um a lot of that has is is just so kind of embedded in our culture then we have right. a bad night's sleep then we have uh, mm -hmm. the, the urge for stimulants all day and, right. um, yeah, coffee at, in the afternoon, when you mentioned the coffee break, yeah. uh, that is, it, it totally makes you more productive because it, it puts off your sleep, um, debt right till later, but you have to pay off that debt at night. And usually it, it fucks up your ability to go to sleep. I don't think that anyone should drink coffee after about 10 AM, mm -hmm. honestly. Um, uh, it, it can be in a, in a pinch if you need energy, uh, coffee can be the useful, but you have to realize right. that you are going to be paying this back for a couple of days in actuality. And one of the the, the really fascinating things in uh, all the sleep research that I'm reading is that you you accumulate something called sleep debt, right? Mm. Where where every human needs a slightly different amount of sleep, but it's between seven and ten hours in general for each mm -hmm. person. But so let's say eight is the is the sort of like uh, median amount that a, pe a person needs. And you can actually find out how much you need if you go to a sleep lab. So it's not like just some whimsical thing. Like they can be like, nope, you need seven hours and 45 minutes of sleep, right? So once you figure out that number, 
uh, if you're not sleeping for whatever reason, if you um, if you're getting like seven hours of sleep every night, you accumulate over the course of a week, seven hours of sleep debt, which means you have to pay that back with napping, with sleeping in longer or something like that, or else your body gets, um, to quote the medical literature, all kinds of fucked up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you for using that, uh, you know, scientific nomenclature. Uh, <laughs> but now I've, this is one of those weird things. So, okay. So you, maybe you have, you know, we're, we're coming up on the holidays. There's going to be a lot of parties and, uh, you know, a lot of drinking goes on a lot of, you know, a lot of get togethers and things like that. Um, you know, those 20 minute naps here and there is, is that 20 minutes back to your, uh, sleep debt or is there an exponential yeah. benefit or how, how would we want to look at that? Well, it's the way the sleep scientists talk about it. It's sort of, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, but I, I, I can't imagine that it actually is that I think that, that your more proximate sleep loss is probably more important than your week long ago sleep loss. And mm -hmm. when I asked one sleep scientist, well, okay, let's say I've been getting seven hours of sleep for 40 years. Right. Yeah. Like, and, and what he came back with, well, that's what we call chronic illness. I was like, ooh, touche. Um. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, they have these sleep trackers and I've, and my, my wife hates it when I do this, but um, I'm, I'm all about, okay, looking at my sleep tracker and I don't know, I enjoy it. Um, <laughs> maybe it's just that I enjoy it, but whenever, you know, I'm, I wake up, and I want to see there's like a body battery on this one. And it's like, this is approximately how much energy you have or whatever. And, um, you know, there's been times whenever, uh, of course, I'll be leading retreats or doing things like that or or during the holidays when there's uh, a lot of get togethers. And I mean, it's just like you're at 10 percent when you wake up in the morning and I'm like, right. geez, I yeah. might die today, I guess. You know, there, there can only be so much tired yeah. that you can experience yeah. what until it really does start to, just like you said, really influence our health. Mm -hmm. And and one of the, the downsides of being tired, you know, uh, I mean, philosophers and as have talked about this for, for ages. And then, of course, you know, with science now, we, we understand a little bit more about it, but it's very difficult to make a good decision, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever you're sleep deprived and you were talking about... Yeah. Um, you know, that, uh, the, the, the conscious effort to, to get into the ice bath or the conscious effort to, right. to do anything. Um, you know, I, I mean, just think about how great pizza must, I mean, we, we all know what it's like, right. The hangover breakfast. It's like, mm -hmm. ah, man, ah, dude, you know, or, or these, these times whenever, um, we're trying to do well, trying to make good decisions, uh, with other things that impact our health, but you're right. just not sleeping very well. Right. Well, I mean, the, I, uh, one of my favorite people here in Boulder is a woman named Vega Kaufman, and she's a like a, a counselor, like marriage family therapist. You know, you've got like problems and, you know, she has people come into her office and her first question is, how are you sleeping? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when, when everything just seems wrong, you're, you're, you're tired and you're irritable, yeah. everything gets worse. Your perception of reality is worse, which is why if you're going to make a major decision, be sure you're doing it when you are rested. Right. Yeah. Like either in the morning, right after you sleep or right after a nap or something like that, because otherwise, and like never have a really, really important conversation with your, your um, partner mm -hmm. when you're underslept or really yeah. hungry, like, cause your body and your mind are connected. Right. And your, yeah. your, your body affects your mind. If you're, if your gut's all fucked up, you might be an asshole. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and so she will treat couples, right. Who come to see her by like, why don't you just, just like sleep better. And, and she's not a big fan of naps, but she is a fan of like prolonging the actual nighttime sleep, which is another, you know, there's lots of stuff written about that too. Um, so guys, just as you have questions, you can feel free to put those in the description box. I've got a few comments. There is a comment here requesting um, the next book be about Sasquatch dreaming. Oh yeah. Um, well, Scott, I do. I my think, wife, uh, this is my wife's yeah. book. It came out, um, it came out uh, like three weeks ago, the search for Sasquatch. Oh, wow. Okay. We discovered that she was related to the world's preeminent expert on Sasquatch. Uh, she was, she's a reporter for, it was yeah, a reporter for NPR. And then she was like, what? And so then this is her <laughs> recounting of like a years long search for like why, you know, this famous anthropologist spent his whole life walking through the, the forest with a rifle and a spotlight. Hunting. When you, when you take a rifle with it, you're pretty sure, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, it but might actually be out here. 
but it's for kids. And this is why this is so cool. <laughs> it's for, it's for like 13 year olds. So get us for your kids. Cause it's also about teaching people about critical thinking. Like she's not oh, like that. It, it's about like, you take the concept of Sasquatch, like, all right, if this did exist, mm-hmm. how do we talk about Sasquatch as like from where does he exist in, in evolution? Like, cause he's not like a teleporting yeah. alien beast, right? Yeah. He, he had to, he's like a gorilla. Um, so, so let's talk <laughs> about that. And so it's, it's a really good book, especially for, um, you know, kids, when they're, I mean, we live in this world of like chaos in the information. Yeah. Um, how do you teach a kid to think critically? And this, it's a, it's a good way to, it's a fun way to do it. That's awesome. Well, that was a request from the audience. Um, and then of course, guys, if you have any other questions, you can feel free to just, uh, to, to throw those in there. Papa geek says he's a little late to the party he says, what's the best sleep tracker. He reads a lot about aura Garmin, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so on. I, I wear the, aura, um, got the aura. I, 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 but I can't say anything about Garmin or whoop or any of those other ones. Cause I don't, I haven't used them. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the, I like how convenient it is to wear this and it shows mm-hmm. people that I'm married. So that's, yeah, it's of, like a double. Yeah. yeah it's like a double threat. <laughs> um, and, but I think the best thing about this, and there's some question about the accuracy of the data on this because it's you know such a small surface area, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it certainly would be reliable. So accuracy is like how close to the bullseye you hit and rely, reliability is like how regularly you hit that other thing that's off the mark. So I think it's really, it's, it's good for telling you time you went to sleep, the, the, you know, like you can see trends really well with it. Right. And my favorite thing about aura though, I will be honest, is that it, it says your bedtime tonight is, and I'm like, fuck yeah, something told me oh. it was my bedtime. And I can be like out with some people. I was like, well, my ring told me I, <laughs> I'm out of this party. And I love that. <laughs> so I've, I've been using the Garmin for the past, I think three years. Uh, and I, before that I used Fitbit Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've, 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 I've thought a lot about these. One thing I like about the Garmin, um, is just, I feel like it's pretty indestructible and the charge is really good. So sure. yeah. it, it lasts a long time. I've got the kind that has the, like the SPO2 and all these other things, which I really don't use all these things very well. I always love it whenever I get into bed and it says, you've got your steps in for the day. I'm like, so I timed it perfectly. Nice. It's the step yeah. into bed. Nice. Mm. That you know? was the one. Uh, yeah. it, it's, <laughs> but, um, it, you know, it tells you how many stair steps you've taken if, if you're going up and down and things like that. The downside about pretty much, I, I guess maybe the whoop strap might be the best. I've not used that one. But when it, if you're really trying to track things like heart rate variability and uh, your, your, your exercise level of heart rate, it's really difficult to do that with something on your wrist or with on your finger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So those would be things to to, to think about. Um, but when it comes to sleep, I, you know, mine tells me how much deep sleep I get and how much REM sleep, how, how's the aura do for that one? It has the sleep tracker and, and the right. graphics look similar to what a scientist would put out. Um, how, uh, I've never actually tested. I've reached out to aura a few times and they tell me that they have the best technology ever. So, you know, That's, take it from them. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I think it's probably reasonably good and it's good to, to, you know, thinking about different stages of sleep is important, right? Because not NREM sleep is useful. It's not just about getting to REM and actually different REM cycles and different NREM cycles at time in the night are differently useful for you. So it's why you need that full amount of time and your body should naturally go there. Um, I don't know what you do with the information when you look at like, well, I I judge myself. I had 17 oh. minutes of NREM. So yeah, I'm like, I, what the fuck does that mean? Like, I well, no, I tell you what it means. It's, I'm a better person than you. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. That's what it means, Scott. Yeah. I, yeah, I, yeah. I look around and I, I say, I, I hit my goals yeah. um, <laughs> because I somehow did that on purpose, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> now I do, I will say, if you want to remember all of your dreams. So this, mm-hmm. is a, this is an interesting supplement that I've been taking now for quite some time. Have you ever heard of DMAE? No. So, so this is a supplement that I, I, I've taken. It's a precursor to uh, choline or acetylcholine in your brain. Now, I've been taking this super cheap too, really, really cheap. Um, but it, it's amazing how I can remember all my dreams now. And yeah, they're absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and, and Jung would have a field day. Um, yeah. But, uh, but that's a, it's, it's like, I think there's like 120 pills in it and you get like for 10 bucks. It's just wow. absolutely ridiculously cheap. So when you remember your dreams, is yeah. that because, do you remember them like an hour afterwards or like, how does it, 
How does the memory store? Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. So, so as soon as I wake up, I can remember, I remember what I'm dreaming. Now, I guess I don't, I don't remember the ones I don't remember. You know, obviously, you know, we, we, I don't know. What did you dream last night? It's now, you know. Oh, that's a, yeah. Terrible things that would make me ashamed to, 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 no. Um, Okay, cool. (laughs) Just, just, I mean, just the worst kind of, of, of porn that is imaginable. Uh, and that's why I love taking DMAE so I can remember every little bit of that. Okay. Um, yeah, but, nice, yeah. Nice. So, <laughs> but, but, you know, there's so, okay. So last night I did, I dreamed uh, there was a guy from my high school that I haven't seen in since probably high school. Uh, and he was still with the girlfriend that he was with in high school. Like I do remember the dream still. Okay. Yeah. And so that's, it's that's amazing. It's like two, two 30. And uh, now I only remember one dream. I assume I had more than one dream last night. Sure. Yeah. You probably, um, well, I mean, you would remember the dream that you just woke up from. Um, that's probably the most work. recent one. And yeah. so what, what they do at over at MIT and the, and the, and the, the MIT sleep lab, sleep training lab, um, they, when they're trying to do dream recognition, right. And they have this really cool um, device that measures your, it's a whole hand device and it's okay. measuring your sleep stages. And when you get to specific stages, it wakes you up so that then you will write down your dreams. And so like, oh, like cool. it's your cued to like, you're like, yeah. it's like, okay, we were in REM for five minutes. Boom. Okay. Come out. Tell me what you were dreaming. Uh, and it's only the, that most recent dream that you can get. But one cool thing that they're doing there uh, and they, they love naps, right? Naps are there. Oh, cool. thing, right. Uh, one thing that they're doing is like, okay, let's say you want to have a dream about um your, your mother who, who passed, right. I haven't had a conversation with my, uh, my mother's alive, but like, let's Mm -hmm. say, say, yeah, yeah. Passed and, and dreams actually could have been really, really useful for mourning uh, Mm. or PTSD and other things like that, where you have this sort of safe space to deal with things and they can trigger a mother dream by doing certain preparations beforehand. Uh, that, that sort of like get you into the mindset of having a dream about your mother. You say to yourself, I want to dream about my mother, blah, blah, blah. And then they have like an 85% success rate in triggering a dream uh, about your wow. mother. Wow. Amazing. Um, also the other thing, which is creepy. Okay. So that's the amazing thing. And it's super okay. useful and it's really good for people in hospice. Like they, they said the most common dream, the, the most beneficial dream in hospice is if you're dying there, um, you have a, you have a dream about your spouse who has already passed. And like, that's usually oh, wow. really, yeah. really amazing. And they can trigger these, which is great. Yeah. All right. Now here's now, now let's go to dystopia for a second. <laughs> okay. Here we come. Here we come. Amazon's thinking about advertising oh, you in your dreams. Yep. Alexa. Oh my God. Windows. Well, they're Tesla's. already listening. Yes. Cause, cause so, so here's the problem is that it can track your sleep stages right? If you're, if, if, if all the data is linked up and knows when you went to sleep, it's like, okay, we're around right now. You're going to be at your most suggestible point in hypnagogic, whatever. And it will say something to you so that you will dream about it and it will be subconscious. And that's supposed to go online in, in 2023, 2024 is what I've been told by, um, you know, some of my sources. So that's the, the horror show that's coming for us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's now I, you know, the, the, as from my research in when it comes to like subconscious uh like subliminal messages and whatnot um they say that they're, they're really not that uh effective um but uh but you know but it's cheap yeah yeah what, and what if it works like oh my we, God. Have, we, have, we now have eight hours of uninterrupted time to advertise to you while you're sleeping i mean I, I hope that you're right, that you can't do yeah. it. But since I know that you can have a dream about your mother. That does why? lead us to think, well, okay. Yeah. And, and when the cue that will often come is, is like, it, it'll be like you're going into REM and then, then an audio cue will play. It will say, dream about your mother now, right? It'll actually that's say that auditorily. And that's one of the triggers to dr- trigger the dream. And then a little bit later, they wake you up, right? So that's how they do it. So why couldn't Alexa do this? Like, yeah. she's, I mean, they know a lot of shit about it. Well, so, and, <laughs> and your phone, right? So, yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what most people have right next to the bed. Uh, first thing we look at when we wake up, last thing we look at when we go to sleep. I, I, I put my phone in another room at night for a number of reasons, but. Uh, what if someone needs you? Who gives a fuck? <laughs> <laughs> your mother's trying to call us like, 
Damn no, it, no. Scotty. That's bullshit. Know? You know how often that happens in a, in a way that's important? She'll be fine. And if she breaks her hip. <laughs> She's a grown woman. She's a grown woman. She takes She's care of it. herself. She's made it through 74 years without my intervention. And she doesn't even live in town. Like, okay, you told me you're, you're okay. lying on the ground. Your hip is broken. What am I going to do? <laughs> Click. No. Scotty, um, <laughs> pick up the phone. But I... <laughs> Yeah, so actually, it reminds me because at night, what do you do? We all turn our notifications off. We all, you know, you you already do that. Um, I I mean, I assume there's some people that might leave the ringer on, but then you have to listen to all those notifications. And I, I actually, my my parents were like, well, because uh, I I turned it all the way down, so I can't get any calls. And they said, well, what if we need you? I'm like. Well, yeah. you know where I live, right? You know, you know so. what? Oh, yes, that's a good answer. So I remember at the like, like not 10 minutes ago, you were telling me you were Gen X. But no, sir, you are a millennial. I grew up mm. and I actually had a rotary phone. Oh, oh, OK, I OK. It. I know how to use it. I can use a rotary phone. I know how to use it. My grandmother had a actual rotary phone. I have made a collect call, sir. Oh. I have made a collect call from... <laughs> <laughs> from 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 one of those that were in the matrix right because if you saw the of course at the time 99 right we were all that's when i graduated high school so mm -hmm. to give you a kind of a, an idea of where where i'm i'm falling into the to the chronology mm -hmm. of things so we all knew what they were at the time but yeah right. I, you, you don't see those very often if i see them i usually take a picture yeah and right. uh and and send it to your gen you know your your what's what's the one on gen y friends and you're like <laughs> what's this yeah right yeah <laughs> hey what's star 69 huh yeah. uh -huh. what's star 69 uh -huh. tell me about it you know uh -huh. and, and then then they're like i, I don't even know that none of that makes any sense whenever pound went to hashtag then yeah. then i was i was just like okay all yeah. right but wait we, we try to adapt we learn we adapt Mm -hmm. Speaking of learning and adapting, Papa Geek is asking, he says, what are your thoughts, uh, Scott, about St. John's wort, melatonin, hops, uh, he says, and other stuff that would help you fall to sleep, fall asleep easier. What, what are your thoughts on those? So interestingly enough, so I, I, St. John's wort, I don't know specifically, I haven't looked up the pharmacology on it. I know a lot about melatonin. Uh, the sleep studies conducted in 94 on melatonin are probably the best ones we have, but they're still studying it. So there's still stuff okay. going on. Um, what it's good for is, is is like sort of resetting your your circadian clock to the appropriate time. So it's very useful for jet lag. Okay, mm -hmm. so you get to a new place and like about two hours before you go to bed, and it does take about that time. So it's not like right before you fall asleep, but about an hour, or two hours before you take melatonin, uh, it can start putting you on the correct time zone because melatonin is triggered by uh, by light diminishing light. Okay. Um, so what you want to do is before you're going to go to bed, do the melatonin so that it sort of like squishes you back to the correct moment. The other, and, and food's also another important trigger for that. Uh, melatonin, interestingly, is only one CO2 molecule, molecule away from DMT. So yes. fucking deal with that for a second, um, it has a <laughs> consciousness moment and, and you breathe out CO2. So is there a connection? I don't know. Maybe, probably, almost definitely. Um, <laughs> Uh, but melatonin is not actually known to be very good for falling asleep chemically. It can be good vis-a-vis -vis the adherence or placebo effect. You take a pill, this pill will make me sleep. Right. It could be a sugar pill, it could be anything. And that might have an effect on you uh, to allow you to fall asleep because your mind is like, oh, it's my sleepy thing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And so, that, so that's okay. <laughs> I will say that the dosages of, of melatonin are usually too high. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's usually five, 10 milligrams. And also they have um, time release, which is like bananas, bad idea. Uh, like you'll never wake up if you're on, if you're on time, time release melatonin. Um, uh, but uh, your brain puts out like point. 0.2 or 0.2 milligrams instead. So the, actually the lower end is probably better biologically. Uh, I, I will say that the, the general consensus in the sleep science community is that sleep aids, sort of like a benzodiazepine or something that might make you fall asleep. It can be good in a pinch, especially under doctor supervision, but really bad uh, over the long term. Like you get mm -hmm. sleep dependence. Um, you know, for instance, in the last last over the summer, I went to, um, to Europe and I started uh, taking Benadryl to go to sleep because it will let me fall asleep. Uh, and then when I came back, 
you know, cause I'll do that. I'll do the melatonin and the Benadryl to sort of like put me on that, that, that curve. Right. But then, then I, then I just got, I just took it for like two weeks that I was abroad. And then I had terrible sleep as I weaned myself off um, yeah. for about two weeks. So that's sort of the, 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 you know, like with any drug, there's mm. benefits if you use it responsibly. Yeah. I, what I have found in my, my use of melatonin, and there's a video on my channel about this, that, you know, there are all sorts of reports that it's not habit forming, mm -hmm. but I, in my personal experience, I, I, my parents or my family, we had uh, a nutrition store growing up. I grew up in a nutrition store and in the nineties, it was the big thing. It was like this, this is a miracle hormone that you can take. It's over the counter. Right. And so uh, it was linked to reduced risk of like certain cancers back then. And it, I mean, there was all these, it was this miracle thing. And so I said, well, you know, I better get on this stuff. And I slept better. And then I took it for years and, um, and then research came out that, okay, you can actually harm your own ability to produce melatonin. And I did notice that there, you know, if I didn't have it, boy, I couldn't go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And so it took a long time for me to get off of melatonin. Mm -hmm. uh, now I still do take it sometimes, like, like I said, when, when traveling. So, so I, I have to travel through time zones, uh, quite a bit and and so that's that's really helpful mm -hmm. um but there's also a lot of research that the dosage is just haywire so you'll get something that says three milligrams which if you're going to take it i would recommend never taking more than three milligrams but mm -hmm. who knows it could have 10 milligrams it could have no milligram I mean, it could it just no, all over the place apparently with those um, what do you think about hops? Uh, do, you, do you know anything about hops? Got, so, I got nothing. I have, yeah. I've never, I've never even heard of hops being used for sleep. I will say that beer is not good for sleep and that comes from hops, but that's all yeah. I got. That's yeah. Literally all I got. <laughs> so yeah. So hops is one of those things they've actually started making some non-alcoholic beer. There's a, a brand I tried called hop water and I, and it's, it's got a lot of hops in it sp mm -hmm. specifically for the flavor, but also it does have a little bit of a sed sedation effect. One of the things, if I were thinking about napping, I would say something like hops would be all right, just because it's, it's, I wouldn't want to take something in it that's going to keep me sleepy for the rest of the day. Yeah. And actually that brings me to a, a question that I have when I do manage to take naps. Um, I typically have a hard time waking up. I feel like, yep. and it could be that I don't normally take them. Yep. Um, any tips for people yep. who are like me or a little groggy afterward? Yeah. So you, you're taking the wrong duration of naps from falling asleep. So, uh, a 15 to 30 minute nap is ideal. Um, okay. it's aim at 20 for a number of reasons, but like 30 is okay. And, and it has to do with your sleep stages as you go from NREM, which is non, non rapid eye movement sleep into deep sleep. It's harder to come out. Cause it's like you're underwater. I, sometimes I have that feeling if I wake mm -hmm. up at the wrong time, uh, like you're like, you're just trying to look like, yes. come up. Right. Yes. Um, so, so you need to time your naps to make them shorter or a full 90 minutes. So your sleep okay. cycle takes about 90 minutes and then you'll naturally come back up to that later stages of sleep, which is easier to wake up from. Even so, it still will take probably about a half an hour for you to get to a fully conscious and focused state. You can use this, you can use the, the free associations to be creative. It's a great time to write, for instance, not a great time to plan out a travel itinerary. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, so my suggestion would be if you're napping, aim short for now yeah. um, or aim Full, the full 90, but don't do any, like the hour seems to, an hour seems to slot into our schedules better. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, ah, well, it's two. I'll nap till three. No, two nap till three 30, because that's actually a really bad time to wake up an hour just, and that's just human physiology. It sort of sucks. I know, but really the problem is the world um, fucked us up because we are not <laughs> creatures of a segmented 24 compartment time cycle. We're actually right. with sun cycles and getting light during the day is important. Being outside is important. Um, you know, there's so many things that are, that are important here. What, what do you think about this? Okay. So every year on this channel, twice a year, not so much whenever we go back to standard time, but a lot, whenever we go to, to the daylight savings time, I will bitch and moan mm -hmm. about the the time change and all of this stuff of that yeah. it's just absolutely ridiculous mm -hmm. um what, yeah, the I, whole country jet lag yeah the whole everyone but arizona and this is the only thing arizona is what? yeah arizona doesn't switch oh everyone you lucky else, bastards yeah right everyone else and arizona is like bananas in a lot of ways but this they got <laughs> right 
Um, uh, yeah, everyone else has this like stupid idea that, I mean, the, the thing is we should be relating to our environment, right? right? We, should, right. We, we, we are creatures of the environment we live in and we are, we are taken out of the natural world. That is the, the that's the, the plot of what doesn't kill us, right? Mm -hmm. We used to have temperature variation. We used to have, you know, uh, food scarcity. We used to have X, Y, and Z. And now we live in a world where the mod, where everything modern and the dictations of our work schedules and everything else are completely fucking up our stone age bodies. Uh, right. And, uh, and yeah, the, the, you know, I think it, there is probably one time zone or the other that might be slightly better for some fucking reason. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But the 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 reality is, is we should be we should try to think more about what the sun is doing. Yeah. And winter is a time for down states and summer is a time for up states. So you have daily cycles, you have and you have seasonal cycles, and we generally just stay in summer all the time, which might yeah. be why we're so bad at, at cold. Now that I think about it, now that I'm spitballing here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a crazy idea. We'll have to, we'll have to workshop that. Um, so the, um, the, I, I actually have heard, um, of course, every year there's more heart attacks when we switch times. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of things that is just like, you know, it's really killing us, but I guess ultimately, you probably already know this, but I, I guess it was uh, Benjamin Franklin's idea. Hey, we're going to save, uh, candles and, uh, and, and oil. Uh, so mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's do the time change. Mm -hmm. And here we are in 2022, still doing it. So yeah. actually they didn't even do it in his time. I don't think. And then later on, I think like, it was a hey, world war two, world war one, world war two thing. I think that's, I think the history had, had something to do with saving energy. Yeah. Um, and there are arguments for why it's good that I, I see every now and then. And I just think that they're so minor and dumb that I, I don't care. But, you know, women are safer at night when it's lighter. Okay, that, I mean, I sort of get that. But, but like, nighttime still happens. That I mean, right. it's, it's like, it's not, <laughs> I mean, going back to your critical thinking, uh, you know, concept, um, you know, which, hey, that's another thing. Maybe that's a book that needs to be written in, uh, in the world we live in now. So, How but until then, <laughs> until then we can make better decisions uh getting better apps so um guys i want to thank everybody for being here today thanks for the comments and questions yeah. um and check out the kickstarter yes time to nap and you're going to put a link in the doobly do but i i've I, the, I and so i think what he's mentioning here is is yes the description box below we'll have uh the link to uh scott's uh, kickstarter so this is a kickstarter can you tell us just a little bit about that uh what they get and how all that works yeah so there's tons like uh, people who sign up there's like 10 different reward tiers but you can get the commercial paperback which is what's gonna be available on amazon or like a special kickstarter only limited edition paperback which sort of like shows that you got in early on this um uh, there's options to go come out here, take a sauna and ice bath with me and we have all these different tiers and things there's some zoom calls there's all sorts of stuff that you have on a Kickstarter campaign. Stickers, you can get stickers. Stick, uh, stickers are good. But, but really, what, what the reason I'm doing this is I'm not trying to raise like a tremendous amount of money. I'm trying to raise up just enough that what my publication costs are, which is hiring editors and uh, recording the audio book and that sort of thing. Uh, and, but I want people to like get excited about it and be part of this process with me. And that's actually very meaningful. Um, form like real connections with people. Yeah. And honestly, who doesn't love napping? Like, if you don't like napping, you are not my people. I'm just going to say it. And I don't want you to support my Bing unless you want to want to start napping, in which case I'll let you into the fold. <laughs> That's very gracious of you, Scott. I appreciate this conversation a lot. It's always nice having you on. And uh, and hopefully I can start. Um, oh, oh, there's a question. It will be on ebook. I assume it'll also oh, be yeah, on yeah, Kindle yeah. and all that good stuff. For sure, for sure. Yeah. And 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 everyone who who supports the Kickstarter gets the book earlier. I'm aiming for an October official release, but really the people in the Kickstarter campaign will get it as soon as I've written and edited it and made it look real pretty. I like a pretty book. So guys, thanks so much for being here. And uh, Scott, hey, this has been an hour that's gone by really fast. So uh, yeah, always fun to hang out with you. We'll have to we'll have to do it again sometime soon. Maybe we'll talk about Sasquatch. Uh, we'll we'll go into that maybe. Who knows? I, I'm curious about Sas. But uh, guys, have a good weekend. Enjoy your Friday. And uh, as always, 
Don't forget to go out there and be kind to one another.